All right, what's going on everyone? Jared Couture here from Kung Fu Music Lessons in Two Cities, One World. Today I'm here with the man, the one, the only, Mr. Tobias Hurwitz. Well, I'm glad to be here. Thanks for having so, me. So thank you so much. And Tobias, yeah, uh, I, I just recently learned about Tobias and he has some incredible music out there. So be sure to dig in ASAP if you're not 100%. You can see his website here. But uh, let's go ahead and begin. So Tobias, can you go ahead and just share a bit of your uh, musical background? Like when did you actually start playing music, the early days and what were your influences and then how did your career um, evolve? Okay, well, I started playing guitar when I was 14. I guess I was a bit of a late bloomer. Um, I just had a friend at a party who I sat down next to and for some reason I was fascinated by what he was doing, just playing a D chord <laughs> and I, uh, and there, from there, it went on to me becoming more or less obsessed with the guitar and carrying it around with me everywhere. And I guess I was self-taught. I was playing my house, my high school dances and things like that before taking any lessons. And I, uh, I did um, eventually go to GIT, and I also took went to a little recording school for you know, some recording uh, trade school certificate. Um, I'm, I'm largely self-taught. I've just been very interested in the guitar for my whole life. I'm 56 now, so I've been playing for a long time. Um, and my influences were very wide. Everything from the punk rock and stuff that I was listening to when I was a kid to things like Carlos Montoya or um, Segovia or Joe Pass is one of the teachers I studied with at, at GIT. And you know, my very wide influences could be anything from jazz to rock to Van Halen or anything like that. That's amazing. Man, that's amazing you get to study with Joe Pass. Um, oh, yeah. Just on that subject right there, could you, is there anything you could share that was, um, that made a mark for you that he shared with you? Something very powerful? Yeah, like Joe Pass. Okay, so when I went to GIT, Joe Pass was there every day. And he was sort of like a beloved uncle to the students, more so than a teacher, though he did teach us. And the way he would teach us was really funny. He would sit in the middle of the hall in a folding chair with, a, with an acoustic guitar and a music stand with a real book on it. And he would play games with us, such as he would say, hey, get over here and sing me something. And I'd go like something like, and then he'd go, exactly the same and anyone Nobody could stump him. Anyone who would sing oh anything, God. he could just echo it right back. And then he would want you to play a real book tune with him. And there would be a line of people waiting to get up and play a real book tune. This is like in the middle of the hallway. This isn't an eclectic master for some reason. Oh my God. Right? <laughs> so, uh, um, but then nobody would make it through the tune. So like, you'd start <laughs> playing the first couple of bars with Wave or something, and he'd be like, no, not like that. Next. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Oh so, like, so then he would tell us um, how he got started. And uh, he had a very interesting story, which was that he said he lived in New York and his family was all plumbers. And his dad would take all the boys to do plumbing every day. Except he said to Joe, your job is to stay home and become the famous guitar player. You don't go with the rest of us. And he would leave him with a guitar. And uh, every time he would come home from work, he would turn on the radio and he would tell Joe, you've got to be able to play the song before it's over or I'm going to give you a whip. Oh, man. And anyway, that's how he learned how to play. Oh, my God. That, that's one way to do it. That's an amazing. He did it, too, and he got really good. <laughs> I'm not saying I recommend this method, but it did get him good. <laughs> oh, my God. That's insane. Oh, my, oh, my. So funny. Well, thanks for sharing that story. That's so cool. Um, and then so I have a little tape, I re he would lecture, or also just lecture, and I've got a few tapes of him lecturing, and he um, he would lecture about the caged system, but he wouldn't call it the caged system. He would be like, there's only five chords on the guitar, they go C, A, G, E, D, and you can play it like a, a major or a minor or a seven, or you can play a scale, and he would say, here's like a C form, and he had everything boiled down to C, A, G, E, D, major, minor, diminished, or augmented. So he would have his ways of playing those forms with major, minor, diminished, or augmented chords or scales or arpeggios. 
and that was his whole view of it right there. That's so awesome. He, yeah. What scale? What scale did he play? I mean, did he just play a diminished scale over the diminished chord, and then for augmented, what did he play? I, I typically play. A whole he would tone. play like a whole tone scale over the augmented, okay. and he would play a um, he would play a, a whole step, half step, octatonic yeah. over the over the diminished, and he yes. would um, yeah. So he would anyway. He had his thing. He had a system that he completely created by himself, and it was very logical and kind of simple except that he could do so much amazing things with it <laughs> yeah wow that's awesome man yeah. so cool so one thing i want to definitely ask you about is um the book uh zen guitar because it looks like you are a part author in this book as well is that is that right well not exactly um the there is the first book zen guitar is written by philip toshio sudo this was on simon and schuster and this is a best-selling book with like over a hundred thousand copies sold or whatever when I got involved with it and um, I'd been interested in Zen philosophy for a while and I received a copy of Zen guitar as a gift read the book resonated with me and I immediately did one of the exercises in the book which was to just play something without thinking about it and uh, and let your hands just sort of move by themselves and see what happens and I, I came up with essentially what you might call a riff, and I wrote a song around it, and I thought, you know, I'll just send this song over to this guy and see what he thinks of it. So I did. He liked the song, and then we started just, like, talking about stuff, and I don't know how it happened, but eventually the book Zen Guitar did very well, and he called me to, to write the sequel to the book with him, and the sequel of the book is called The Book of Six Strings. So me and him then wrote the sequel together. Um, now, one of the sort of tragedies of this is that while we were doing all of this, he got, he contracted or was diagnosed with stomach cancer and he died as we were writing the book. So the book of six strings, though it has his name and my name on it, it's kind of like mostly I wrote it because he, he passed away like during the process of writing it. But um, I did my best to get his, his message across, though I think it might have turned out a lot better had he still been alive to really have the final say on, on everything. But yeah, wow. so that's out there. I'm I'm a part of the Zen guitar movement and connected to the book Zen guitar by doing that. That's amazing. I'm so sorry to hear that. That's, an, uh, that's such an interesting experience there. Yeah, um, it, it really is. Um, and he he was an amazing guy. I mean, he had some very profound uh, thoughts about music and uh, life and philosophy. And I remember he would be in the New York subway playing guitar and he had his stuff he played. And it was pretty much 100% original music. And um, he wasn't, he was more of the punk rocker. I mean, he, uh, he was a sort of emotional stripped down player and uh, and he would, I remember like, okay, so he had a big notebook full of handwritten notes. And when he passed on, I got this notebook. It's part of how I wrote the book, this is the book of six strings after his passing, was by looking at his notebook and trying to take as many exact quotes and ideas out of his, his stuff as I could. And one thing he said that I thought was fantastic was, how many songs does a bird have? Only one. And that was the way his music was like he had his thing and he would go and play this in the subway every day for people and it didn't matter whether anyone was listening or not he was just playing his stuff like the bird sings its song and um i thought that was really cool and um it charged char caused me to write a chapter in the book about that topic and he had lots of kind of wonderful thoughts like that and um and I got the feeling that Zen guitar is a little different for every person because of that. So, you know, like with my Zen guitar, that's not your Zen guitar. It's an individual expression. Hmm. Wow, that's a wonderful, I've never heard, heard this, the bird that's so beautiful. I have to share that uh, we do have a song called The Revolution and it's about nature. But the thing is, the, the, the hook is sing with me. It goes, sing with me, do, 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 about a revolution, it's evolution. I'm not the singer, but this is the lens. However, I did write the song. And the thing is, I was sitting outside with the birds playing music. And the more I played, the louder they would sing. And I would test it. And I'm like, is this really happening? And I'd stop. And then they would calm down. 
and I play and they sing. And I did it, I've tried it, I've tested it so many times I know it works now, but so I finished that song and really wrote that song with the birds singing That's with me. Cool. And I was in 432 that day, I happened to be, whether that really made the difference, you know. Well you, well, you know, what's interesting is that as I was researching this whole idea of birds singing, I decided I'm going to record some birds singing and I'm going to write out the music and see what it is that they're actually singing. So one of the things in the book of Six Strings is a couple of bird calls that I transcribed. And I was astonished to find that these things were in perfect pitch. They were like, the birds are literally like a whippoorwill goes, do 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 will That's like, do 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 that. It's a major scale. So a, a whippoorwill is actually singing a perfectly exact major scale with where the main notes are right in, in exact 440 perfect pitch, surrounded wow. by little tiny notes that are like all over the place. But the main notes you really hear are all right on the scale. And I did three different bird calls, and I found that they were all in exact perfect pitch. And it astonished me because um, I had read that Pythagoras was the one that came up with intervals and uh, and things way back in the ancient Greek days. And I think now that maybe Pythagoras was listening to birds before he did that. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Wow, but that's it's interesting so stuff. Cool. So, um, you know, yeah, it's something like taking taking a recording of a bird and, and, and transcribing it like it was a Van Halen lick is quite an interesting uh, thing to do. Yeah, that's so cool. And I actually just did this last week. I, I recorded these birds and noise outside and I wrote and I had my voice recorder on my phone and then I just titled it transcribe this. I was did thinking, you do it? You I have not I have not done this yet. However, my really plan was to hear if they yeah. come out when I found it, the main notes are right on the pitch and are correct. They're surrounded by clusters of very quickly moving um, other notes that are like kind of like ornamentations in Baroque music or something, but they're like way all over the place. But the main notes are all of the, what well, I did, the main notes were right on the, on the scale. Beautiful. I love it. The birds love to sing, you know, I love it so yeah. much. And that's in the book of six strings, those transcriptions are in there. I'm going to definitely get that book. And I did order the other book. I'll, I'll order this one too. If whoever's watching, get these books. These are going to be very, very yeah, good if right. you don't already have them. And, um, Actually, the yeah, funny thing is, Amazon. yeah, the funny thing is I, I learned about you because I had something on my program up and actually somebody, I didn't tell you this when I first talked to you, but they actually um, were like very rude to me and saying, uh, just some person commenting, saying that I plagiarized and totally stole the idea of Zen guitar. And I had never actually heard of this book. And I, when I looked at, the, that's okay. And they said a lot of stuff and that's what, that was okay. But uh, when I looked at it, I was like, oh, okay, okay. I see, I see, this is awesome. And I love this so much. And then I just thought, the funny thing is like, then I contacted you and I'm so happy that person complained <laughs> because I, because like, and I really just, I'm so happy for it. I'm just so grateful. Because now you because, found out that there's an existing Zen guitar movement. Thing. Well, I found, I found out, found out about you. I found out, yeah, about all, all this, just this beautiful thing that this person is saying. And, and, um, and it's so cool. So thank you, you know, if that person sees this. And with that, with this in mind, so I also want to ask you about the way of the Zen, way of Zen guitar album, your album. So can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, sure. Um, that album, I'm about to re-release the material from it. It's actually not out there right now, but the album came out right when the Book of Six Strings came out. And there were these things which we called Zen Guitar Festivals, which were in Manhattan. And um, I, I was playing them and in my band at the time. Anyway, I cut an album called The Way of Zen Guitar. It had the, the song Zen Guitar, which is the one I sent to Philip Sudo, which got me involved. That's that's the, I guess that kicks the album off. And then I had a few other songs on there. And uh, really, it's just, like I said, Zen guitar is different for everybody. This is just me writing instrumental music that uh, I expressed where I was at the time. And uh, some of it was completely improvised and some of it was very scripted out. 
And I also had paid tribute to Philip Sudo by doing a cover of one of his, his song is called One Sound, One Song, O-S-O-S. -S. So um, since I told you he would play his own music in the subway, he had this kind of, he had 12 different little movements or themes that he put together that would create what he called One Sound, One Song. And I just I did one of the, I did a tribute to him on that, which was largely an acoustic guitar piece with a little bit of percussion and stuff mixed into it. Um, and so it was really a pretty much a, a tribute to Phil and just just to sort of um, to put something out there in the Zen guitar movement. And there's a number of really good other releases by other members of the Zen guitar community. This guy Rod Brown's got super great Zen guitar record. And then there was um, the guy that that did the web site for Phil, and his name is escaping me off the top of my head, it's been years, he has a, a very nice release. Phil Pseudo himself has one called Zen Guitar, it's so great. So uh, there's a lot of stuff out there um, with that. Wow, I had no idea. I'm, I'm so, so excited to learn more now. <laughs> and yeah, yeah, I've been listening to this album of yours, so now with this insight, this is exciting. I'll, I'll keep listening and re-listen and, and feel some more magic. Yeah, I'm, I'm releasing new stuff all the time. Uh, I just released, the most recent release I had was a single called Leviathan Warrior. And it's from a video game I just scored for Johns Hopkins. And um, it's, I, I like it a lot. It's, it's out there on all the platforms. And uh, you'll hear that, I mean, it has a kind of, kind of a spiritual warrior kind of sound to it. Uh, when when you score a video game, or at least when I did, the people will tell you how they want the player to feel. They won't tell you what they want the song to sound like, but what they want the player to feel when they hear the song. And this this song, uh, it's about the player has reached a level where they have the skill to survive this battle that could threaten their life, and they are going into the battle as a confident warrior, but still they know they may die. So that's why the song, and it's all about under. The, the game is about dolphins fighting sharks underwater. So I call the song Leviathan Warrior. Wow. Um, that's my most recent release. It's out there on all the, all the platforms. And then on Earth Day, which is coming right up, I'm releasing a new video, my version of the song Yesterday by uh, Paul McCartney. And it kind of has an environmental message in that it shows me playing, playing an unaccompanied chord melody of yesterday superimposed over beautiful natural scenes. But then as the music keeps going, those beautiful natural scenes turn into fires and smoke and garbage in the sea. And it just basically says, hey, if we don't if we don't clean up our act, then this beautiful planet will be yesterday. You know, Ooh, to us. That's good. That's you know? powerful. <laughs> yeah, Very so powerful. that's coming out on Earth Day. I mean, that'll be out there on Earth Day. So I hope you guys check that out. Thank you for doing what you do. And I told you once, I think um, when we spoke previously that the idea of becoming a musical monk is that we purposefully kind of take care or protect something. It's not just about protecting, but it's like, what does a monk do anyway with these skills? They're not fighting, but it's like for music, it's about putting a proper message in a music that will lead the consciousness to any positive place. It doesn't matter, you know, it doesn't have to be so over the top, but I think that, you know, the music can be one of the most powerful tools to get a message across more than politics, more than anything in a song, you know, so the idea of the high levels is we're purposefully writing healing music, we have to at least know how, and purposefully putting in proper messages, and um, so I think that's amazing that you're doing that, and would you mind sharing your thoughts on this more, like, and how long have you been purposefully using, you know, using messages of positive tool for these positive messages and and uh, what do you think about this whole thing well uh, I think that well I, I guess that uh, I've, all, I've often thought of morals as being important having sort of a moral code by which you live and act and I apply that moral code to every situation I'm in and it doesn't mean I always have a positive message in my music but it means that if a situation arises in which I have, say, three choices of how to act, I already sort of know how I'm going to act. I don't have to think about it. I, I know what 
what the what I think of as the good action is, the right action, and it is generally something for the, the greater good, not for some selfish end. For, you know, so there's that, and then there's uh, just being kind to people and um, and really trying to help uh, other people. So whether it's by putting out an environmental video or just by, you know, like if I got a kid that's studying with me and their parents get evicted and they say they got to pull the kid out, I'm like, no, you don't, keep them going, you know, or, or, or whatever. Y'all won't charge you for a while. I mean, you know, I, this is, I've, this is the, you know, it's just the way of, of life. And um, I'm really into like the teachings of the Dalai Lama and the yoga, the yoga philosophy with the yamas and the yamas and, you know, the, um, also the way, I mean, just, you're into Shaolin Kung Fu and, and so am I. And, uh, you know, I mean, the, the monks didn't learn Kung Fu. Well, some of them were kind of gangsters that took refuge in a temple, but the, um, the main idea was that they're going to walk the earth spreading spreading the, the, the word of the buddha and as they do walk this feudal china they may become attacked by people on horseback and that's why they need these spinning high kicks and stuff um so i just i think of myself kind of as you know maybe uh maybe a bit of a spiritual warrior in the yoga sense where i'm just you know i'm really aware of what i think right and wrong is and i'm trying to do the right thing that's really nice yeah absolutely awesome man can you talk a little more about the your relationship to kung fu and also how maybe so that and how that has um affected your music maybe how has this potentially sure. affected that um or so your approach to that, music the same guy that started me on guitar got me dabbling in kung fu when i was a kid and he uh he's gone now but there Overdose. But um, but I never did pursue the kung fu he taught me. I mean, he, he taught me a few kicks and stances and blocks, and he was just kind of like playing around as kids. Um, when I became a father myself, my son, his name is Toby, went through a troubled teen phase around the age of 14 or 13, which is, of course, something that happens to me and other people when we were that age. And I thought he needed some guidance. And I said to him, hey, you know, why don't to pick an activity and I'll take one of your friends and you to do it and we'll do it together. And he said, I want to do Kung Fu. And I wasn't against it. So I said, sure, let's do Kung Fu. And I one of it so happened that one of my original guitar mentors was a Kung Fu uh, grandmaster. And um, and, with, and it happened to do Chinese praying menace uh, Kung Fu. I didn't know anything about Kung Fu, really. I just said, I'm going to go to my old friend and it so happened I was then in uh, Seven Star Praying Man's Kung Fu with my son and his friend. We did it for five years. I got a few belts and um, I got in a lot of sparring matches. And yeah, so I, le I learned how to use some weapons and, you know, I really enjoyed it. The stretching, the Qigong exercises, all that stuff. Um, and when the school closed down, I, I quit going to, I, did, I decided well, I'm not studying anymore because the school closed down, but I kept doing a little Kung Fu just, you know, just because I liked it. And um, at a few years after all that, I had a home invasion in which I had to use the Kung Fu to, to save my own life. And I, so I've actually had to use this Kung Fu and since having to use it, I've gotten back into it. I've gotten sort of re-energized with it. And um, I've also, my yoga practice has also energized me with it because for the last maybe six years or so i've been doing yoga pretty avidly but i was um i was always uh, wondering how i could feel more of the prana or the key or the whatever you want to call it the key gun the prana the same sort of energy that acupuncturists uh manipulate um and so i was in yoga and i was unable to feel the prana and i couldn't feel it when i was in kung fu either so i went on a sort of a quest to learn how to feel prana and i i went through a number of um sort of false leads and dead ends and i i was almost gonna i was sort of getting a little discouraged like what is this is this real i can't really feel this and 
Then I saw, uh, I don't know if you ever heard of Amo the Hugging Saint. Have you heard of I, that? Yes, I absolutely have. A lot of my friends were here in St. Louis. They go to Chicago. I, I go to the Center for Spiritual Living. And a lot of the people there, <clears throat> I still have not met her myself. I really want to, but they have Amo water blessed water always. Me, me, my wife and I play there, so I drink the water every time I'm there. I know of her for years now, but anyway, that's so cool well, that you mentioned so her. Mama comes to my area once a year and hugs thousands of people for free. And I thought, well, I need something really powerful to like get my energy to flowing. Like I can't feel anything. So I'm going to go to the Alma and get a hug from her and see if that works. And I went and got this hug from, I had to wait for something like eight hours <laughs> and doing all kinds of like, they're doing kirtan, all this is going on. They, they provide free Indian food that's wonderful. Um, anyway, so I finally get the hug from Ama. And um, during this hug, I'm thinking to myself, I'm not feeling anything. What is wrong with me? I'm not feeling anything. I'm not feeling anything. As soon as I disengaged from Ama, I got hit with a ton of bricks of energetic feelings like I can't even describe. Like, um, for instance, as soon as I disengaged with her, uh, my vision became different. Things looked different, brighter, weird, like like not, not, not like you're high or something, but just a sort of a different perception. And you feel my energy was buzzing. I could feel the buzzing and the, uh, the life of the energy in, in and around me. And I walked off the stage and I was in a state of euphoria, just sort of a, and, and high energy. Now I had driven two hours and gotten a hotel room and waited eight hours for this. So I thought I'd be so tired afterwards that I want to go to sleep. I couldn't have gone to sleep if I, if I tried. I decided that I could stay in the hotel room and drive home. And I had this buzzing energy for two weeks afterwards. Wow. I mean, wow. like charged up like an energizer bunny. Everything I did felt amazing. I, you know, it was just utterly unreal. I've been back to see her every time. And ever since having that experience, now, if I do a Qigong exercise that I learned in Kung Fu class 10 years ago, I can feel, I mean, really feel the Qigong. When you do the, the dancing around with the energy ball, I mean, I can gather so much energy that I'm feeling like I'm on fire. Um, and I, you know, when I do the yoga, it's, you know, sometimes I, anyway, so she broke the ice for me with the energy. And ever since then, both my Kung Fu and my yoga have become incredibly more meaningful to me. Wow. So, that is so uh, amazing. I, yeah, I, I'm, you got to do it. <laughs> I have to, before I go to Bulgaria, <laughs> I will meet this woman. That she is so amazing. She probably do it in Bulgaria. She travels the world doing it. I'll check it out. Absolutely. Oh, my God. Um, so, yeah, so anyway, the, 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 the Kung Fu, how does it affect my music? Yeah. Um, and you can talk specifically about that energy, too. Uh, like what you just mentioned, maybe using that energy for music or anything you want, but I just want to well, let's see put that here. out there. Um, well, it's hard to even, since I've been doing music so much longer than I've been feeling Kung Fu energy, I'm not going to say that it's the main part of my music or anything, but um, I would say that sometimes when I, for instance, bend a note, I'm kind of feeling like I'm doing a Kung Fu strike with, with like the follow through through and the intention and the emotional content of that strike put into the music. So like uh, music has technique and it has emotional content at the same time. And so does uh, Kung Fu, right? So, <laughs> so I kind of, I feel like that a little bit. I feel like I'm Bruce Lee when I'm, I'm bending a note, I'm, you know, or, or something like that. Uh, but. You know, it, it, I'm not going to say there's a giant correlation for me. I, I did like when I studied Kung Fu how to get a belt. There's a list of things you had to be able to do. So to get your blue belt, you got to do this form and that form and know this weapon and that weapon and this stance and this kind of sparring or whatever. Um, and 
obviously having a list of uh, skills that you can do or teach people to do is kind of synonymous with the way Kung Fu is taught. But then again, you might say it's um, most of the way English literature is taught. I mean, you know, it's like, but if I do like that list of techniques and that the blending of emotional, spiritual, and uh, physical action to create something. Yeah, that's really cool. And the spiritual aspect as well. Within, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Would you would you talk a little bit about that too? Um, how spirituality spiritual re- could influence your music or, uh, yeah. Anyway. Well, yeah, this. like, uh, sure. Um, I, uh, well, spirituality, of course, is different for everybody. And um, you can't, like my kind of spirituality is likely not to really be the same as somebody else's. And I, most people don't even know what my spirituality is because I feel no importance in me telling it to them because it's probably not what theirs is anyway. But uh, but to make it in a a nutshell, my spirit, I I basically believe in karma. And I believe that um, that when you experience something uh, that you don't like, that this is you paying back karmic debt that you have somehow accrued. It could be during this lifetime or a previous lifetime. This is what I believe. I don't necessarily, I don't try to tell anybody else to believe what I believe. I'm not um, saying that anyone else's beliefs are wrong. But I'm saying that my belief is if something bad happens to me, it's because I did something bad before. If, in this lifetime or in another lifetime and that I find comfort in knowing that I'm paying back a karmic debt it, it gives me a sense of um, of purpose amidst the chaos of life so I mean when something bad happens to me I don't feel as bad about it anymore I feel bad about it but I know that if this doesn't happen now something else will happen later. I got to pay back this debt. You can't get out of it. Whether it's in this, not even if you die, you can't get out of it because next life you got to do it anyway. <laughs> so so uh, you might as well just face it like a man and, and get and do it, do pay back your debt. And um, and so this gives you a much, gives me a much more uh, stable sense of sort of calm, calm and acceptance and gratitude. So, um, if you know that you're not in control of the bad things that happen because you have a sort of karmic backlog of things that must play out, then you know, I'm simply waiting to see what happens. I'm drifting and waiting. And when something happens, I'll react in whatever the best way I can is. But you're not anxious about that thing and you're sort of um, trying to experience life in the moment that you're in and knowing that if that moment is pleasant, you should be grateful because it's not going to be pleasant forever and there's nothing you can do about it. <laughs> that's, that, that's, that's how I think about it. Uh, that's interesting. I also think that um, after having met Ama, I believe in saints now. I didn't used to believe in saints. And now I believe that the uh, big important saints, you know, such as Jesus or Buddha or whatever, I think that they're all valid that they all represent um, legitimate pathways to the divine and that you don't have to go through one of those portholes but that you can and many people do yes in a, in a nutshell. yes 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 good so the last part of that question is I do want to know still about talking about this prana and this energy and do you specifically so, so here, let me, let me say it like this. I've been asking people a question a lot, which is like, how do you bring music to life? Because sometimes you bring it's- music to life? Yeah, because sometimes I feel like, especially when we go to school, it's easy to take the life away from music. Like for example, you're just staring at a chart and not feeling anything, just right. play something, but there's so, so there's no life. And I, one time I wrote down, just, just like random notes to myself, I said, don't, don't force the life out of music. 
you know, and some, so sometimes it's very magical and alive and sometimes it's very dead and it's, and it's, I don't know, it's not alive. So okay. yeah, in relation speak to that, yeah. So, so hold on, but in relation, I want to ask you with that and this energy you're talking about, like, do you, I'm asking, do you use this prana energy purposefully to put more life in music ever? I think I do. Um, well, one thing is I'm 56 years old and I play rock music mostly. <laughs> yeah. And I often play with people that are a lot younger than me. So there's a lot of youthful rock energy going on. And maybe a lot of, and the audience is generally a lot younger and much more energetic, not more energetic, but they got the youthful energetic thing going on. And um, I find that my, my healthy lifestyle doing yoga. I also eat very, uh, I eat almost all organic foods and um, I don't, I'm not a vegan, but I'm very close to being a vegan. Like I'll eat wild caught fish, I'll eat honey, you know, I think those are the only two animal products I eat. Um, but what it, what it amounts to is that I have physical energy that I, I can go for many hours without slowing down. I can be in a a hot urban rehearsal studio without air conditioning with a bunch of guys that are soaked in sweat and i and i'm not even though i'm way old 20 some years older than these guys they're getting tired before i do so um i think i use energy largely to keep up with people that are younger than me that's one thing i do and then i also sometimes i like to have a, a physical uh, aspect to the performance I do, you know, just like moving around on stage, kicking, jumping, whatever. Um, and I think that when I'm doing this stuff, it's infused with that prana energy. And I also find that, like I discovered my yoga teacher, one of my favorite yoga teachers, probably my favorite, her name is Claudia Newman. I discovered her as a singer in a rock band called Sister X. And it's just a local rock band that I really liked, but I found myself going to see them again and again and again and again. And why am I going to see them? Because the singer has prana. And I didn't really know it at the time, but now I do know it because she's my yoga mentor. And, you know, so, 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 so uh, I didn't even know she did yoga. And that was before I was really even into yoga, but it sort of drew me into the prana drew me into it through music. Um, now, I, I'm not so sure that, I guess music is such a part of me that I don't know how I could do it without prana. But I will tell you some ways that you can slip out of prana in music. In one way is by doing too much memorization. So like, for instance, when I was a younger guy, I mean, I play in a lot of cover bands, play seven nights a week, and well, you gotta play those solos the way that they wanna hear them. So you, you're gonna play whatever it is, I don't know, some song by whoever it is, Eric Clapton, and you play the solo the way Eric Clapton played it. So you memorize this solo and you can just execute it. And you, and you do that with lots of different songs. Everybody looks at you and says, that guy's really good. He sounds just like Eric Clapton. Then he sounds just like Van Halen. Then he sounds like whoever else. Well, this is a sort of a trap you can fall into that sort of de-energizes you. You, in my opinion, if you don't do improvisation, you aren't really in the equation so much. You're, you're learning the physical uh, thing that you have to learn to, um, to execute that solo. And not that you don't learn from that, you do learn from it. But, um, but you, you don't feel joy and you don't feel your own energy. So when I, every band I'm in now, I make sure there are improvisation uh, opportunities because I don't want to be in a band if I can't just jam. And I also like to execute solos note for note. I think it's a kind of a, just, just like in Kung Fu when you do a kata, you do a form, whatever. Well, you're going to go through this thing and execute it just so. But then what if you really spar? Of course, you're not going to just do a, do a form, right? <laughs> so, so I think that people can de-energize themselves by doing too much memorization and they can rely on this and everyone thinks they're really good, but really they, they can't play anywhere near that level, actually, if they just jam. 
So I'm, I'm one of the projects I'm working on at the moment in my own development is to be able to jam at the same level as copying solos, to be able to toss off a solo that sounds really, really good. Um, so so I, I'm, that's what I'm working on myself. And of course, when you work like that, you're working. You're not, you're not coasting. You're reaching for ideas. You're not sure if you're going to make every idea you reach for. And that gives you a sound which I think of as the sound of effort. So if you don't have the sound of effort, you don't have, have any energy. If you're just like you're asleep tossing something off, what fun is that? You could just listen to a record. You could listen to the original artist. What's the difference? Um, so, uh, so I would say that that's one way you could avoid becoming de-energized is by daring to improvise, essentially, and actually working on it instead of just just memorizing. Um, and then another thing would be. If you get a mel melodic idea or some sort of idea, like you could be asleep and wake up with a tune in your head. And if you jump up real quick and record it, well then that tune is really you and it's, you know, that's a way of taking some of your energy and putting it into the music. Uh, um, I also find that if you uh, just experiment long enough, that you will come up with something that is really you. And um, you know, and this has to do with experimenting. It has to do with just taking two chords and how many darn ways can you play these two chords? Everywhere on the neck, lots of ways. You do that for a while, you're going to come up with something that's you. It's going to be your energy. That's cool. It kind of makes me think of like Bodhidharma or something like sitting in the cave for nine years, like really taking time to experiment for a long time, you know? Yeah. Yeah, that Bodhidharma, yeah. It's funny because you, I've been looking, I mean, obviously everyone, if you're into Kung Fu, you know who Bodhidharma is. And um, you know the Shaolin temples have their legends of Bodhidharma coming over from uh, uh, India to China and bringing, bringing the wisdom from the Buddha over to China. Um, and anyway, it's, I think it's pretty darn cool that you're actually studying with some of these people. That's so neat. Yeah. It's amazing, but you know, one thing I've, one thing I learned is, so I know I'm friends now with two, uh, two people who grew up, three people actually, that grew up in the Shaolin Monastery, the Shaolin Temple. And it's interesting, like these people are people and, and just, you know, it's just like about a spiritual philosophy of never assuming. You know, when we can learn to not assume anything ever, except for the moment that is, uh, there's so much freedom in there. But I'm saying this because also because like thoughts that I, you know, I'm watching all these documentaries on Shaolin monks and this, and then, and then I get to meet some people and my expectation or idea of what they might be is is not what necessarily anything what I find. You know, yeah, well, it's, it's you know, so I mean interesting. I'm sure we all watch the old TV series called Kung Fu. I love it, yeah. <laughs> where it's sort of like, I love it too. But that's a sort of idealized Shaolin Temple. And I think the Shaolin Temple, I mean, I, I'm not a scholar of Chinese history so much, but um, but it seemed to me the Shaolin Temples, um, they were definitely places of the way of Zen. Yeah. But at the same time, there were sanctuaries for criminals because you could, criminals could take sanctuary in a Shaolin temple and, and according to the law of the, the ancient China, you, they could basically become monks and then they would learn the Kung Fu and go out and sneak out and do crimes with it and stuff like that. So, um, so the Shaolin temples have a sort of mixed history of, of, um, of being sort of highly spiritual and yet almost cowboyish in a sense. You know what I mean? Some, yeah, my chief <laughs> told me this one time. He did tell me that. He said some monks are good. He's like, you know, but there are people who who learn some things and do bad stuff with it. You know, he did say that. Yeah. That they so leave that's them. reading articles in, in history. You see that. And it's just so inspiring that Shaolin temples ever existed. And is, that, is there still one that exists? Yeah, the original one. There's multiple. Oh, there. Is that where your teacher teaches and lives? That's where he came from. He, wow. From five years old, his mother was 
too poor, dude. He had two two sons and or a couple. I think just two sons, or I don't know, maybe another sibling. Uh, um, but anyway, they, they put the brother. She put the boys in the Shaolin Temple because supposedly she didn't have the money to take care of them, and they grew up there. That's and that's amazing. Yeah, it's an interesting story. That's it's so pretty cool. amazing. Yeah. He told me he tried to run away one time and a couple times, and he got uh, uh, just just beaten very badly. He said that the that once tried to run away, and then I don't remember how it happened. Somebody got him, or he came back, or I don't remember what it was. It was like 14 years old or something. And he said that when they brought him back, he um, basically the Shifu made everybody just beat him up, like all the. All his kung fu brothers, like everybody. <laughs> wow! <laughs> and he also said, like you know, they go on a run every single morning. Wake up at five every day. There's a there's a schedule, and he says if you're not there on time, like you get beat with the staff. <laughs> like you show up on time, everybody gets beat if you're not. So it's a pretty strict, um, you know. There, there's there's a lot of discipline there. Yeah, it sounds like the running at five in the morning part is probably the part I want to skip. <laughs> right. Intense. Every I'm usually runs. asleep at five in the morning. I like to go running, but when I go running, it's usually like midnight. Right. <laughs> That's just my personal skip. Wow. <laughs> cool. Whatever works. Yeah. Cool, man. Well, here, I'll, we'll, so we'll segue into some, a couple more musical things. Um, so one fun question I, I'd like to ask you are, uh, who are some people that you that you consider musical philosophers and that you kind of learn music philosophy from, some wisdom, some musical wisdom, but let's say music philosophy. There are some people that you... Well, the big one is obviously Philip Toshi Osuda, the author yes. of Zen Guitar. That's my big philosophical musical mentor, but we've already talked about him. Now, I just picked up... Uh, You've seen this new book, book by Steve Vai called Vidiology. I, I I'm so I know I just ordered this too. I saw this. I saw What's this on that? your. I saw oh. this. Yeah, I'm ordering this too. This cool. uh, this book is. Uh, I've seen him talk about it, and I'm like, okay, finally, like I'm getting this. Okay, so I got that book recently. Now Vai is is I've got mixed feelings about him. I will say that I love him generally. That I, I consider him a very just an incredible master of the guitar and blah 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 blah. Anyway, um. His book, I'm liking it and I'm recommending it to people. It takes music theory, and it's like a very dry topic that you'd think has been presented in so many times that you don't need another book on music theory. But his book on music theory takes it kind of into a spiritual and philosophical realm in many ways. And uh, he'll have his, his sort of dry topics, but then he has another thing he calls experiential learning which is when you internalize this topic and literally merge your being with this topic. And um, anyway, so I think Steve Weiss could be a kind of spiritual musical influence, especially Absolutely. if just his book of ideology um, is, is definitely that way. There's no question about it. And I'm getting some stuff out of that. And even though I've, I, I know all these topics, there are things about them I've never thought of before that he's saying, and it's great. Um, yeah, have you ever do you know who Victor Wooten is? Of course, of course I take lessons with. Wooten. Of course, yeah, I take anyway, lessons with Reggie too. And, yeah, that's uh, right. Just, you, yeah. Anyway, Victor Wooten uh, has a spiritual sort of music book. I think it might be called the Music Lesson. The Music Lesson. Too. Yeah, absolutely. Everybody who hasn't read it, read it. It's yeah, very, so, um, very fun. <laughs> so he's he's a sort of musical philosopher type of guy. And to tell you the truth. Maybe my biggest musical philosopher guy is Frank Zappa. Absolutely. I was just thinking about that too after you mentioned Steve because Yeah, absolutely. and um, I've had the pleasure of hanging out with his son Dweezil a bit and actually working with him a bit. Um, we taught a class together uh, a few years back at this place called the Crown of the Continent Guitar Foundation. And um, Dweezil is very true to his father's uh, ideologies to how to play and um one of the things that zappa did was every guitar solo zappa took was improvised that you hear, hear on a recording and if he and he he took recording gear with him and recorded live whenever he played and every he'll never play like copy the solo from whatever you know like dirty love or something he'll play a new new solo every time and then dweezil is the same way so I was teaching my students, uh, I was teaching them 
a way of playing where you think of a lick, you think of an idea, like you might think like ba da 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 ba da 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 ba da 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 So you like you get an idea and you and you play the idea because you're thinking of the idea. And so the weasel comes in and he starts playing all this stuff, right? And one of my students goes, Mr. Zapp, uh, how do you get such complicated ideas and just play them? And he says, I don't do that. <laughs> and uh, then he goes, Tobias, you know, play me an A note. And I'm like, here's an A note. He's like, well, you know, over this A note, you could play um, any note, couldn't you? Couldn't you go? Now, some people are telling you, that one's a bad one. And that one's a bad one. But that one's a good one. And this is a good one. And this is a good one. And this is a bad one. But he's saying, to tell you the truth, you could play any note over anything. So now keep playing that A note. Now here's a bad one. What if you go? Suddenly this bad note isn't so bad anymore. Maybe this one's bad. That's bad. But no, it's not bad if you have So Dweezil um, was, was presenting a, a different way of thinking about uh, improvisation where, where you don't just get the idea and play it like the blues way, like the way I was doing it. It's like you throw something out there and you mold the clay as it sort of hits the fan. <laughs> so, um, so when Dweezil started saying that, it really opened my mind up to Hey, there's more than one way to think about these things, and um, and that's the way his dad thought about it, which is why he's doing it. He learned it by by growing up around it, and I kind of think both ways are important. I really like can you hear it and play it, um, but I also like this sort of more abstract idea that the Zappas have. Can you just throw something out there and and just deal with? It? Yeah. <laughs> so, so anyway. Yeah, that's awesome. I think everything is good. You know, literally everything is good. You know, everything you do is going to be good. It's all awesome, and mixing many perspectives is is good, and using what you what you like best. But yeah, absolutely, I like like that's the, like the Joe Pass thing you were talking about. Like he was. That's amazing. I mean, that is one heck of a skill. That's a good practice. You know. To yeah. Work. That's. Yeah. I mean. That's rough. To, I mean, that's abuse. That's child abuse. Did he have like perfect <laughs> but, pitch or something? I mean, he must have. I don't know, but he could just somehow or and he must he must have because you could sing anything at that guy and he could just play it right back. The I first mean, it could time. Be anything. The first time. No <laughs> no screwing around. The first time. Yeah. <laughs> that's just <laughs> incredible, man. Pit yeah. in 1986. I went there in '86 and graduated in '87. <laughs> And I remember trying to get lessons with Paul Gilbert. Now he was blowing up at the time and he was so popular that you all these guys are crowding around and you can't get in there. But across the hall, there's this little brown haired mousy girl named Jennifer Batten. Uh. And I'm like, hey, she's about as good as Paul Gilbert. I think I'm gonna go over there because there's only two other people over there. Right? <laughs> you know? so, so I'll be studying with her. And then pretty soon she comes in with this giant crest of blonde hair, hair extensions, and she has a Michael Jackson gig. And then she's just gone. <laughs> but, but, but um, yeah. So GIT was a great experience, and Tommy Tedesco and all these people. I mean, it was great, amazing. Frank Gambale, you know, they're they're all there. It was neat. That's amazing. Yeah, I got to take one lesson from Paul Gilbert while I was there. He yeah. came back to do, you know, just I don't know, just some special thing. I got one thirty-minute lesson with him. And uh, did he teach you his easy to pick licks? It's like the, the uh -huh. way he does this. What did no, he do? I made I made a massive mistake. Um, actually, I'll share this this because uh, this was very dumb. This was not a very smart, uh, evolved spiritual <laughs> mindset. Basically, whenever I basically he did the same thing with everyone, which was jamming on like a one four, like an A minor, like A minor D major kind of thing, you know, mm -hmm. sevens, whatever, and. 
and he, first he would just say, okay, let's jam. And he would just jam for a long time. And it depends like that, 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 that flow could have gone the whole time. But I was in there and I was doing that with him and I was thinking, man, this is cool, but what am I doing? Like, this is just a one four. Like, let's talk about something for real. Like, we're just like, I can, I know I can play all the everywhere on the fret where I'm thinking, you know, this is too much ego in there or something. I'm like, what, why are we just playing a one four? Like I actually had prepared to ask him certain questions that were specific to his style about these arpeggios. Cause I noticed he would do these weird ar like arpeggios in ways that I'd never seen anybody else do. He's got so many ways of doing it. And so this is what happened. So we jam and I'm like trying to end the jam for real, which is stupid of me, whatever it is. I learned a lot from this experience and the jam ends and he goes, now what I would do with that is, and I interrupted him and I said, you know, I really want to know about this, uh, this way you do these arpeggios. Would you mind sharing some, some interesting things? And he goes, okay. And he didn't tell me what, he never gave me the critique. You know, which would have been the gold for me because I, I mean, I, I should have taken what he would have seen something through me and helped me evolve. And I didn't take it. And I asked him this and then he goes, okay. And he showed me some stuff that was so complicated and difficult. And it was like almost impossible for me to do or remember. He was just like, okay. And he like threw you know me under the bus. Yeah. Hey man, live and learn, right? But it was awesome. And I'm so grateful for it. And I'm so it was just incredible. So it's all good. It's all good. But that is what I did. So I recommend that, you know, if anybody is a, you know, don't do what I did for the listeners <laughs> to, you know, be prepared to take what they want to give. Because that guy wanted to give me something special, you know. Yeah, well, anyway, that, that makes me think of um, the Japanese word senpai, which is kind of like it's kind of like sensei, but it's senpai. And it means one who has walked before. Like it, it doesn't mean master, but like you, you know, you were there. You took a lesson with Gilbert. Now you're telling everybody, let him do his thing. You know, you've been right. there. <laughs> you're a sensei. Uh, senpai. Yeah. That's that's cool. Cool man. Um, well, here just uh, additionally to the whole philosophy thing. Maybe you've already said this today in here, but um, I want to know because we asked. I asked about some people who you like, and but oh, but are there any specific kind of like philosophies, like your more like guitar moral code that you use and that you teach that you could share a few like, you know? Yeah, I, I do have a couple. Okay, uh, when you're playing with other people, you should be enabling them to sound good not using them as a platform to blow them away or whatever. <laughs> like, so, so um, some people play with others and some people play against others. Some people come into a situation wishing to be perceived as the best player there with that in mind before they even walk in. And other people walk in wanting to make music sort of as a team. And um, I try to encourage my my uh, students to make music as a team and to, for instance, learn how to play some freaking rhythm guitar and play it in time and play it nicely so that someone else can play on top of it if they want to. <laughs> you know, so too many of these people are just like playing all this lead and they're burning all this lead, but then when it's your turn to play lead, they can't even keep a steady rhythm because they've never bothered to learn their chords right. So this is a, a pretty gross example of this, but it's um, it happens. something it's that a real I thing. try to encourage <laughs> my students to pay as much or more attention to learning their chords and their accompaniment than the lead, because the meat and potatoes of guitar is basically chords when it comes down to it. Um, without chords, I don't know, it's just that's like 70% of guitar or something. You know, <laughs> so the guitar solo uh, is only a part of the song, just you know, not the main thing. Yes, so I try to get my my students to be less concerned with looking great themselves and more concerned with the team player or the big picture, or just being helpful to the other musicians they're playing with, like giving them a leg up. Um, I uh, I try to make my I, I really think it's important for my students to learn how to read music. Um, and when you learn to read music, you don't just learn to read music. You learn the names of the notes on the fretboard. You learn steady time. And you learn how to play without looking at your fingers. And you also learn how to read music. <laughs> so in terms of musical teaching philosophies, I like people to, to play nice with others. 
to learn how to read music, to learn how to improvise instead of only memorize. Uh, um, I, I don't try to tell people um, in terms of things like charging money for, for gigs and stuff, but I think that if, if you're playing music for money, you're in the wrong business and there's easier ways to make money. <laughs> yeah, you know, like, I mean, if you want to make money, what, could you just be a doctor or a lawyer? Wouldn't that be easier to make? If you, you know, so not that we don't make money. I'm actually making just fine. I, 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 I have no problems. I, you know, I, if I want something, I buy it. If I want to go somewhere, I go there. You know, it's fine. Um, but but I spend a lot of my time doing this without getting paid. And to tell you the truth, I do a lot of things now without getting paid if I want to. So. I don't care about the, the pay. What I care about is the work. And uh, and if if you care about the work, you're going to do the work, whether or not you get paid. And if you have that attitude, you're probably going to get paid. <laughs> so, so that's that's how I think about that. Absolutely, man. That is the truth right there too. <laughs> and you will get paid <laughs> if you do the work. Absolutely. Thank you so much for uh, for sharing those things. Um, so yeah, I guess a couple more little things like, can you just share one profound moment that you've had in your career? Just any one like fun little story or one thing that's really stuck out that was, I don't know, just, just somehow very uh, a monumental moment. Sure. Um, yeah, so um, I got a job playing guitar for my local football team, the Baltimore Ravens. And um, what this means is you have to go and play in a stadium full of 70,000 screaming football fans. And you don't decide what you play, the producers tell you what to play. Now, sometimes you play by yourself, sometimes you play with a rock band, and sometimes you play with a big marching band. The first time I had to do it, I had to play Eruption by Van Halen unaccompanied in front of 70,000 people. Awesome. And this is my first, this is my debut at doing this, right? And I've never been in this, I've never played, I mean, I've played some small stadiums, like 20,000 people or something, great, way long ago. But I, but as an adult, I hadn't played a stadium since I was like 18 or something. And it was a much smaller stadium. <laughs> so uh, anyway, so I felt myself starting to get nervous. And I was like, damn it, I can't screw this up. I've got, I've got to play this right. I can't get nervous and screw this up. So I started using a technique I learned in yoga called belly breathing, which is, um, I think you probably know what it is. You breathe so that the, the, the air comes, fills up your belly deeply. Yeah. Let it out slowly. And I find that 10 breaths of that, if you can manage 10 breaths like that, that it will change your consciousness. And um, anyway, I knew that I was about to start playing, but I thought maybe I have time for 10 breaths before I start. And I did, I had time for exact, exactly 10 breaths before I started. I played it perfectly, the crowd erupted in applause. And then from then on, I wasn't nervous in front of the stadium audience. Um, and anyway, so I, it was a, a way of using a sort of Zen or, or Kung Fu or yoga thing to help me through with my music. And uh, there was one other time after that when the rock band played by itself and we played Purple Haze. And um, I put the guitar behind my head to play the solo and I heard the whole stadium erupt in gigantically thunderous applause because I was all over the Jumbotrons playing behind my head. I didn't even know if anybody was really paying attention to me. But when I heard the whole stadium just applauding so loud that I couldn't even hear myself. And I was like, this is total rock and roll victory. I was like, yes. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Yeah, there's a couple fun yeah, stories. That's amazing. Right? Yeah, I also heard your, um, the song that you were uh, featured in with uh, Michael um, Batio. Michelangelo Batio? Mike, Michelangelo, yeah, yeah. I saw him at MI as well. That was so cool. Yeah, we did a couple, we've done a lot of things together um he had me guest on i don't know what you're talking about because he had me guest on his album and i've had him guest on my album 
more than once and also we wrote a book together too so um we've done a bunch of stuff but yeah so he's like a technical wizard of the he, he's a state-of-the-art technical guitar player who is like his top speed of 16th notes is 250 whereas mine is only maybe perhaps 210 or something but he's it's but, still really fast so, like, 16th notes against uh, what just picking but, I mean, in general what's that he I'm can saying... pick every freaking note at 250 yeah. perfectly. Yeah. And uh, it's great. It, well, so anyway, he's, I consider him a guitar teacher. He's never actually given me a lesson, but I've worked with him so much that that is a lesson in itself every time I work with him. Um, and the song I think you were talking about is called Meet the Master. Is that the song yeah. you're talking about? Yeah. Well, that song, um, had a team of shredders on it. It had me and Michelangelo Badio and four other of my shred buddies. One of them, uh, the names are Chris Rainier, who's a producer in Hollywood now, former guitar student. Um, David Martone, Dave Martone, who is, I don't know, some guy that did stuff like opening up for Joe Satriani and releasing a bunch of albums and stuff. And um, Kurt Bell and another guy named Glenn Riley. Anyway, technical players. And I thought, what I'd like to write a sort of a vehicle for these guys to just shred their asses off more or less. And I'll sort of lay back kind of almost and play melodically through a little bit of shred. And I'll let these guys just let it all hang out with the technical shred. And so that's where that song comes comes from. And it's sort of, it says meet the master. It's sort of to, to try to fool the, the listener into thinking this is all being done by one person. But really it's, six people with all their abilities rolled into this one song so it's kind of like okay everybody brings their a game and plays their fastest wildest most technical stuff and and that's what it is it's, it's pretty cool it's, it's out there if you want to listen to it it's on itunes it's called meet the mask that's super cool uh what's the title of the book that you did together uh, shreds boot camp okay awesome well, cool, man, Tobias. I just for, for the final question, I just want to ask you, is there any final parting words or wisdom <laughs> that you would like to um, share for any musicians and, and specifically, well, also people who are, you know, in, in it for the Kung Fu, which for me is like a life dedication to music, who, people who are in it for the long haul, you know, what kind of advice would you have to share, things you'd like to share? I would say that if you can um, enjoy playing by yourself, in front of two people, in front of a hundred people, in front of 70,000 people. If it doesn't matter how many people, or if there's any people, that's, that's a great feeling. Awesome. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much for, um, you. for having this conversation. It was amazing. So everybody dig into his music, listen, check out these books, get as much as you can. Also, I think Spice, you are available for lessons, is that right? Yeah, I, I'm doing Skype, Zoom, and FaceTime lessons. And anyone who wants to hit me up by emailing me can. My email is on my website, TobiasHerwitz.com. Or you can Facebook friend me and message me through Facebook. And um, yeah, I'm here. If anybody wants lessons, it's what I do every day, all day. Awesome. Great. So get in there, guys. Learn from the master yourself. Thanks, Jared. You're welcome. Nice to right. see you.